One phrase I like from the AI world is people sometimes say we, we sort of grew language models rather than it built them. They're like an organic being that we discovered and we don't know what they can do. Like we didn't make them for a purpose, we made them and now we're like, what is this object or what is this like organism type thing? <laughs> so it's really strange because we know they have all the kind of like latent possibility in them, but we're not quite sure how to bring that out. There's so much to learn about what it takes to design great AI experiences. So I've been keeping a running list of all the different mental models that designers a heck of a lot smarter than me are sharing with me in these interviews. The more that I talk to people who are thinking about this stuff every single day while working on products like Claude, Perplexity, Dot, Humane, one thing is becoming increasingly clear that Everything is changing so fast, but even if you took a freeze frame and just looked at the state of the world today, there is still so much that we don't know yet. Kyle Terman has this great phrase. They say, even if the models never got better, even if Claude 3 was it, Claude 3.5 was it for all time, there's probably still like years of design work left because there's just all these things that the model can do that people don't know how to get it just is it's opaque it requires this like dark art of prompting you have to understand all of these different concepts and and technical ideas and so there's a lot of like interesting design problem that clip was from joel lewinstein who's leading product design for claude and a lot of those interesting design problems that he's talking about stem from the reality that designers have way less control over the end user experience now. As a result, we kind of have to take a step back because we can't think about user flows and journeys quite the same way. Most existing software is something like being on a train or a subway, right? There's a series of stops. You can define the journey ahead of time. You could map the entire space. You could say it's the New York City Metro map, right? It's like there are only 47 stops in this system. I know how you get to each one, right? I think the current paradigm is more like being dropped in the middle of a field with no map or trails. You can do anything. Just the number of degrees of freedom you have is almost literally infinite in that it's language based. This is like both the astonishing power and opportunity of LLMs. It's also like pretty intimidating. I think the challenge of a design team working in this space is to provide just enough wayfinding and pathways that people feel comfortable, but to not lock them into like a monorail system. And so mm -hmm. there's existing patterns that work here, you know, suggestions, templates. You can give them guidance, light guidance, heavy guidance, cow paths that maybe like guide them gently, big roads with barriers where you're like, you seem pretty stuck here. We're gonna like funnel you down this path so at least you get somewhere. And then for the people who feel really comfortable, there's always walking through the field in a direction that no one has asked you to go down. Real quick message and then we can jump back into it. So I've been using this new product to do research called Genway. It uses AI powered interviewers to help you gather qualitative data at basically an infinite scale. So I've actually been interviewing listeners of this show all over the world. I tell the AI what I'm hoping to learn and then it has a dynamic conversation with each person. Genway then organizes all of the key insights for me automatically. So I learned more in a two week study than I had in a year and a a half prior. Needless to say, I am totally hooked. And if you want to take your research to the next level, head to dive.club slash Genway to get two months free. That's G-E-N-W-A-Y. I've been anticipating today for quite some time because Raycast notes are finally here. Now, their old floating notes product was my go-to for quick captures, but they've truly taken it to the next level. There's markdown for formatting, keyboard shortcuts, multiple notes. You can even create a quick link to a specific note and assign a hotkey to it. So that way you can quickly open it up from anywhere in a single keystroke. It's just another way that Raycast helps me stay in flow while I work. So if you're not using it already, seriously, I can't recommend this product enough. Head to dive.club slash Raycast to get started. That's R-A-Y-C-A-S-T. Okay, now on to the episode. Designing products with infinite degrees of freedom kind of changes the way that software teams operate and also how we even think about design deliverables because we can't design every single outcome in Figma. It's literally impossible. Just take perplexity, for example. 
Here's their head of design, Henry, giving us a little inside look. No matter what the user wants to see, we should represent that information in its most perfect form. Let's say I want to know the stock price of NVIDIA. I could show you that in Markdown with just text, right? And I could bold the, the latest stock price and I could do a bullet list of the history. But it would be a lot better if I showed you a graph that you could then interact with, right? That's like a much better representation of that information. Designers are thinking about this experience, but they're not communicating it with mock-ups. They're communicating it with guidance. It becomes much more of a collaborative end-to-end -end product crafting process rather than like design handoff to engineering because you cannot design all the cases. Just explain what the user is going to get and what the vision for the product experience is. And then you and the engineers, you build it together in a very collaborative conversational process. It is a UI systems problem, right? You're building the system, you're giving it tools to use and hoping that it works most of the time. That's the best you can do. I want to underline the phrase, giving it the tools to use. Because as a designer now, you're responsible for equipping the AI to dynamically meet user needs on the fly. That's why I love this next metaphor from George Kettenberg about what it's like designing the humane AI pen. The term prompt engineering gets thrown around a lot. I kind of think prompt design is more of an interesting term. Like I'm designing this kitchen and the model is the chef and I have to put the right things in the kitchen in the right place so that the model can make whatever the customer orders because we don't know what they're going to order. And that's where a lot of the trial and error of like, oh, crap, somebody came in and ordered this thing and we didn't have like a lemon peeler. And so I need to like add a lemon. And this is a very abstract example. But a lot of times the iteration was just like being where it fell off the rails and being like, oh, we need to like add this kind of tool or like, oh, we should add, you know, this pre-processing step in the pipeline so that we have this piece of information here that if we need it, we have it. Mm -hmm. It's experience design, no different than thinking through why did this person fall off this onboarding flow. To extend on George's metaphor, if you're designing a commercial kitchen, then you have to work backwards from your understanding of what the heck can this chef even make? And the fact is that it's always changing because as Joel from Anthropic puts it, working with AI is a bit like watching your child grow up. I have a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a four-month-old, and there's this just magical experience of being a parent, especially for your oldest, where they figure out a problem for the first time. I mean, it can be as simple as they've never managed to open the box of ice cream cones before, and then they do, or they're learning to read or they're making these logical connections between things that you've never seen and, and critically you've never taught them. And then I'll turn to my wife and be like, did you know he could do that? And she's like, <laughs> no, this is amazing. And that really is what it feels like sitting on top of these models. Like our just astounding research team is like pushing the state of the art. These models are rolling off the assembly line. We're all poking and prodding and we're like, huh. I didn't know it could solve this level of problem before. What does this open up? There's a key phrase in there that I want to call attention to. Joel, almost without even thinking about it, says, we're all poking and prodding, kind of almost like playing with the AI a bit, which reminds me of another metaphor that Jason Yuan, the co-founder of Dot, shared with me. To understand a new material, you have to play with it. You have to take it out of the Play-Doh box and go like this. You can't like draw a little picture and show your like engineers like, hey, can you make the Play-Doh do that? And they're like, no, but the Play-Doh can do this. The Play-Doh can stretch. Have you considered that? You know, it's like, you just have to play with it. I think the best designers maintain a sense of play, playfulness. They like to play. George Kettenberg hit on this idea too, really stressing the importance of viewing AI as a new material that we get to design with. I kind of look at it as this like, alien space metal that has like crash landed on the planet and like it's a new material it's like a new thing that as designers we get to work with and the only way you really understand a material super well is by just experimenting with it and like trying stuff and just like continuing to like push the envelope of like well what can this thing do you know like Imagine if you had the first time you saw wood, you're like, what do I do with wood? You know, you would start trying things and you'd be like, oh, if I bend it this way, it breaks. But if I like heat it up with steam and bend it around this other thing, I can make these like really cool curved edges. You just have to go deep 
on these materials and just try a lot of stuff to see where they break and to see where they don't break. Now you might be hearing this and thinking, but like, what does it look like to actually quote unquote design with these models? And I get it. I was right there with you. So here's a quick story from Joel to shed a bit more light on what it looks like. I have a fun story there. So we were working on a feature that basically does this, right? Like it looks at a chat. It says, here are three next steps we think you might want to do. The designer working on it, Samin, she brought it to crit. She shows it. It's kind of like the, the UI, the rectangles are like, Pretty straightforward. It's little suggestion chips that appear underneath the chat. She showed some examples. You're like, yeah, that's pretty good. Like, that makes sense. Those are good next steps. We should think about, you know, when and how to roll this out. And the crit was sort of tailing off just because it was good. Like, there wasn't a lot to say. And then someone was like, can you show us the prompt that you used to ask this other instance of Claude to make the right suggestions? And she brings up this seven-page prompt wow. with, like, all of these instructions and examples and little tweaks and like the art of prompting is like this dark art. And she had just, she had iterated, I think she said like 75 or hundred. There's like hundreds of iterations, trying different combination of prompts, looking at it, seeing if it made sense all to get this thing that was just elegant and simple for a user. And so th this was another sort of like, big awakening moment for me switching into the AI world is prompting is part of the design process and designers need to know how to do it. Now I'm pretty confident that we're gonna have a lot of fun as designers exploring AI as a new material, but if you zoom out, all of this technological innovation is creating endless opportunities for designers to make things, start companies, solve totally new types of user problems. So I wanna end with one last metaphor from Colin Dunn, who's the founder of Visual Electric. Because when electricity was first invented, nobody was thinking about the microwave yet. We're heading towards a future where there's going to be many foundation models that are available. And are going to become increasingly specialized for different purposes and they'll be available either through open source or an API. We see that as like the sort of electricity layer. If you think about it as a metaphor, like those are the electricity companies and they're, pro they're providing this new form of power to the world. And what we want to do is we want to build the appliances that are going to go in people's homes. So now you have electricity and the first thing that you do is you replace all your candles with lights, right? That's the obvious thing to do. Nobody was thinking about the dishwasher or the microwave or the refrigerator when electricity was invented. Those were new kinds of appliances that only made sense in the context of every home is now wired. So we think there's an incredible future and world to explore that is entirely agnostic from the foundation model and it sits at the sort of application layer. Hey, it's Rid. Don't forget, if you wanna go even deeper, each week I send an email out to over 10,000 designers with bonus resources and key takeaways from these conversations. So head to dive.club slash email to sign up. Okay, I'll see you next week.